Hi. 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 Thank you for being here today. Um, this was a really cool opportunity for us. My name is Pammy. This was introduced. I'm Rachel. Hi. And uh, this is our first academic presentation, so uh, bear with us a little bit. And since it's been Books Week, we thought we could get away with kind of a sensational title. Um, at least we didn't get you. But um, nevertheless, as she mentioned, we did write a book. It was published this year. It's called uh, On Drowning Raft, How Two Women Took Down Their Sexual Harasser and How You Can Too. So we'll try to make the connect here as to why that matters with banned books. And we wanted to include some quotes um, specifically. And we're going to kind of determine how we, we shall ping pong this. Um, but ultimately, the tenor of our conversation is about intergenerationalism. Uh, Gloria Steinem is uh, a hero of ours. So the quote, we need to remember across generations that there is as much to learn as there is to teach. Uh, it's a good one. Uh, Janelle Monet, I always think about the next generation and creating a different blueprint for them. That's my goal, to let them know there's another way. And Janae Ingram, the elders, their responsibility is to guide us, to engage us, and to tell us how we can better strategize uh, what lessons they learned. So let's talk a little bit about topical versus perennial. The conversation, has anybody never heard of sexual harassment before? Of course you have. Not one hand is raised because you have heard about this. Do you know what it is? Maybe, maybe not. Maybe you, what's up? Oh yeah, go ahead. Do you have a definition of sexual harassment? Um, sexual harassment. It doesn't just have to be anything specifically sex. It can be comments on your body. That's right. Or even comments on your gender mm -hmm. and how it can make you worse, especially in the workforce or academic settings. That's a great That's definition. Fun. Thank you. Did everybody hear that? That was great. Good. So let's talk about some of the things that we heard when we were going public about being sexually harassed by the same person. And it wasn't just the two of us. It was many people in our community who had been sexually harassed by this individual. For decades. I mean, it had gone on for tens and tens and tens of years. Right. So, yes. We heard things like, is he really that bad or is he just an asshole? <laughs> we heard, why didn't she report sooner or at all? We heard, you better hope this new little project of yours doesn't bump up against your husband's career. And that project was to take down our sexual harasser. We heard people are just being pussies and they need to move on. But we also heard people say, I thought it was just me, I really did. It hurts me when my daughter tells me that I didn't do enough. I wish I'd had this book when I was younger. None of us are safe. The lack of change, accountability, and honor in this process has sickened, has me sickened. And power doesn't want to let go of power. So we wanted to talk about power a little bit. Do you want to talk about power? Sure. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> um, it really is just the definition speaks for itself. Um, the ability to do something or act in a particular way, especially as a faculty or quality. The capacity or ability to direct or influence the behavior of others in the course of events. Power can be shared as in power with or used as a form of dominance or oppression as in power over. And that brings us to your definition. If you're calling in attention to someone's body or the clothes that they're wearing or asking them to question their gender identity, what you're doing is assuming power over that person for that moment. You're telling them that you have the ability to make them feel uneasy or uncomfortable or unsafe in that moment. And that is abuse of power um, and that was something that we encountered with our harasser and other people encountered with him in so many various ways it wasn't always sexual harassment sometimes it was racism um, it was his sort of flippant use of the n-word when he thought he was among people that he could get away with that with um he he it was also the the f-word with respect that's to right. the go. lgbtq community as well that's right so in in most instances this particular person could find a way to put himself to make himself feel more powerful than a marginalized person in his presence. 
What's interesting about the power dynamic here was this individual was a national figurehead in a very particular space of homeless veterans, which meant that he had distinct power over incredibly vulnerable people. So while he, we have documentation of him using his power over us as um, people in the workplace, as volunteers who are helping to carry that mission forward to help people, we don't know what, if anything, was occurring with people who were relying on this individual's nonprofit for their own literal stability. And that's the very dangerous concern about power over. So we want to talk a little bit about intergenerationality, which I'm, it's a very um, <laughs> big word that sometimes I might not be able to say that quickly. Um, so let's talk about how we met. Do you want to tell that story real quick? Sure. Okay. Um, in 2021, in, I believe it was April of 2021, I had just come off of a three year social media hiatus. I had decided to sort of go underground for a while. I had just become a mom and that, sort of changes your identity and sometimes even turns into an identity crisis, depending on <laughs> how you handle it. Um, and I needed to just sort of be my, be alone and by myself for a couple of years. So I wasn't on social media. And then when I came back, I had just been on, I was kind of flirting with Twitter. Like I, I didn't really want to get on Facebook yet because I knew I know too many people in Toledo. So I wanted to be anonymous. And so I got on Twitter and I learned about these like hot take accounts. Um, that were anonymous people that were, you know, watching the news 24 hours a day and had something interesting to say about current events. Um, and I kind of decided I was going to be a version of that, but locally. So I came out um, as a, an anonymous, I had an anonymous moniker on Facebook. My name was Orange Julius. So I went on sort of a friending spree and I gathered a bunch of people on my page. And then I started talking one day about the fact that I had worked for this nonprofit 10 years ago. And I was their development director, which means I did their fundraising for them. And I was supposed to raise money through grants and um, events and sponsorships. Grants, I'm not great at, but events, <laughs> I'm really good at. And sponsorships, I was okay at. But I didn't meet my goals as a fundraiser for that organization. But 10 years, in, with hindsight of 10 years, what I was able to do was look back and say to myself, I was not a failure for not raising the money. I was a success because while I was working there, I was able to have this harasser removed from the board. He had harassed me and a coworker while I was working there. And so my focus turned to getting him away from us and having him removed from the board. So I couldn't be a great fundraiser. I couldn't be great at that job because I was very busy doing something else. But I, in my life, had kind of painted that as a, as a failure. You know, I was a terrible fundraiser, but I was a really good activist. You know, I saw results. So I started to sort of wax poetic about that on my page and got a, a significant response about it. And then I decided to go a little bit deeper and say, this guy has been harassing women in Toledo for decades from the protected seat of these two, well, one local and one national organization that helps veterans and, and um, particularly homeless veterans. And somebody took a screenshot of that post and sent it to Cammy, Right. And we were not friends. Did not know Orange Julius or Rachel Richardson at that time. But when I got that screenshot, it had no explanation. It was just a screenshot of her post. I knew exactly who she was talking about. She didn't name the harasser, but I knew because it was a very similar story. So, and there were other stories that came out, I think, within that post because people knew this had been going on, like she said, for decades. So we got together. Um, I sent her a message said, I don't know who you are, Orange Julius, or maybe I do and I don't, but uh, I have documentation of, of this individual sexually harassing me in my public government email. So uh, whatever's public stays public. It must stay on the record in perpetuity. So um, we got together within a few days and in that one tea time meeting at Sip Coffee, we had a whole strategy as to how we were going to take this individual down because if it was happening to us 
as well as the people who had commented on our page, as well as what you had witnessed in the workplace for you, as well as another woman named Heidi who came forward with us, we can't possibly be the only people this was happening to, and it needs to stop because it was never public. And since it was never public, this individual was allowed to continue to be in spaces with vulnerable people or people who weren't necessarily vulnerable, but were on their way to getting harassed by this individual. We put out a post jointly to say, without saying who it was, we were going to be working together to take down this individual. And we were going to do so in a way that we would blog about it so that other people knew what we were going through. Because statistically, if you haven't been sexually harassed, which you probably have, you will be. Our book is specific to the workplace and volunteer space. So that's really the limit of our scope. There's a lot of other harassment that occurs, street harassment, et cetera, but th that was our scope. Immediately, we got um, the elders in our community, the women specifically, shutting us down. Like, well, you need to, you need to make sure that you include his side. Why are you doing this? You better hope that uh, this little project of yours doesn't bump up against your husband's career. That was my mom that said that to me. Right. Uh, well. Yeah. Right. <laughs> yeah. I'm not over it. Go ahead. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it really made me mad. And she knows that. Yeah. Oh yeah. She, <laughs> she read it too. Yeah. So I wanted to read a a piece from the book. Uh, Rachel and I wrote this book together. It's in both of our voices. We didn't really merge our voices. We have two distinct voices. So um, I'm going to read. From the chapter that's called uh, and also in a call for intergenerational discussions throughout the time heidi rachel heidi and i were interviewing or recording our personal experience of being sexually harassed by the harasser i would find myself feeling insecure about my own story without question i knew it was gross but was it as gross as rachel's or heidi's i wondered then my mind would spiral do I even have the right to be sharing the same space with them? And should we lead with their stories first when we interview? Geez, if people only knew how much worse some of my other sexual harassment encounters were. That's why I was taken aback when Rachel, Heidi, and I began working on our shared goal to take down a harasser and camps formed. Matriarchs defended the patriarchy's abuses. Younger women claimed that everything will be better when the boomers and traditionalists die off. And when I say this happened immediately, like I had said, uh, it was immediate, like within minutes of our first joint post, simply stating that Rachel and I had met for the first time and we're going to take down our harasser, not even naming the guy. Some women, most of whom identified as feminists, cautioned that we needed to do X or we shouldn't do Y because of their experience and then insert unproductive response du jour. <laughs> Then the post devolved into young women and folks arguing with the elders. Ultimately, we understood that these folks were scared for us and wanted to protect us in their own way based on their own trauma ghosts. But it seemed like some had embodied the perspective that that's what happened to me and it's my turn now. And I wonder what the intended impact of these kinds of responses were. Like, did we honestly believe it was positive behavior to run roughshod over others in the name of protecting them or fearing for them on their behalf. If we embody the kind of closed-minded perspective that only we understand our very specific suffering, that only we have trauma ghosts because of physical or environmental variables, mostly out of our control, that anyone else who does not align with our political ideology, culture, socioeconomic background, neighborhood, ability, or age cannot possibly relate in the way you want, then we all miss the gat dang point and nothing will change for the better. Elders leading with fear and planting these seeds uh, in the next generation will neither inspire evolution nor invoke revolution. Contrarily to middle-aged and younger folks who are awaiting the day when great granny will give up the ghost so they can assume her seat is not the equivalent of automatically receiving the matriarch's wisdom and lived experience. And so what that meant for us was we have got to have more intergenerational conversations about this, intersectional, intergenerational conversations. We heard a lot of women say things like, well, maybe if I had done something, he wouldn't have sexually harassed you. No, that's not, we don't think about it like that. We think about it as don't shame and blame and guilt other people when they come to you with their very personal story, believe them. So 
Now linking it back to banned books. Um, fewer resources leads to increase, increased shame, guilt, and silences, silencing. Um, I don't want to make any assumptions that anybody here has seen Ferris Bueller's Day on. <laughs> okay. All right, so if I say resources, <laughs> people, oh God, yeah, sorry. Okay, patriarchal systems use shame and guilt. I'm going to say that again. Patriarchal systems use shame okay. and guilt. That is the power over. That's how you're kept silent. That's why you are kept in a particular place. Um, it keeps society from pushing back from uh, against power structures. That could be an institution. That could be the workplace. That could be family. Um, it keeps employees from questioning workplace policies or lack thereof. It keeps congregants from progressing traditional gender roles and norms, and it keeps historically oppressed individuals from gaining equality. Can I talk about this? Sure. Well, we've already defined sexual harassment. Um, so people who have read the book have typically come to us with this with this response. Um, they usually what we learn, and this is might get a little bit unpleasant for a couple of seconds, is that a lot of people confuse sexual harassment with sexual assault. They're very different things. We were sexually harassed by this guy. He was definitely, he did cross physical barriers. And if you really wanted to get deep into the law of things, he could have been charged with assault and battery a couple of different times with a, a few different victims that we know of. The criminal justice system is set up so that people who would, if you know, if I were to go to the police and say, this guy hugged me and I didn't want to hug, yes, that is assault, but no police officer is going to actually file a charge. Um, so we, we did not take the legal route, but we have found that in a lot of our talks, we had to spend time talking about the difference between sexual harassment and sexual assault. So that was something that needed clarified. Um, the general process of reporting sexual harassment. I mean, I think a lot of people have maybe didn't know, but now know for sure the documentation is the most important thing. Um, it's one of Cammie's favorite things to talk about because she's a quality control professional. Um, so she was very good at documentation. She had everything she needed when it came time for us to put together our packets and our affidavits to send to the board of directors to eventually uh, force this guy's resignation. I was not great at documentation. And, and you'll see if, if you ever have a chance to read the book, you'll see that our stories <laughs> juxtapose in that way. I had to sort of go on fact finding missions and try to drudge up information that was 10 years old, whereas Cammie had hers like, you know, with signed and stamped and so. Flag, right. I had highlights. I was right. ready. I was right. ready for this day. Right. <laughs> we have about two more minutes, so I'll get through this. Um, intergenerational discussions in families book club. It's really difficult to talk about this with people who um, don't live in your generation. It really can be difficult, but we do encourage you to have the conversations um, with elder women, elder men, people who have ever been in a workplace. I mean, sexual harassment affects everyone, whether or not we want to admit it. Um, and you've discussed the power over in the workplace. Right. I want to do one quick thing that is not in the presentation. Those of you who are intrigued by this concept or by the, the, the idea of there being a book, this is a workbook also. It's not just a memoir. Um, so there are workbook pages that you can uh, fill out yourself. If any of you are intrigued by this and you want to take a deeper dive in your classes, bring it up to your teachers. We would love to have this be part of curriculum um, in uh, women and gender studies, in I don't know what other uh, departments it might fall under. People who are fluent in business, in, anybody who's going into the workplace, right, right. We think that this will is, impact you. Yeah. So that's our little plug. Um, thank you very much for having us. We appreciate your attention. Was there anything you want to close out with? Yep. Let's just close out by talking about sexual harassment is a perennial. We st or isn't topical. It is perennial. And so uh, there was a question posed by two speakers ago that had to, it was about who benefits if that information isn't available. And the same question is here, who benefits if information isn't available about what to do when you are sexually harassed? So what we encourage is there to be more intergenerational discussions because power will never let go of power um, and the beliefs that that just is the way that it is. 
but it doesn't have to be. So thank you very much, everybody. Thank you. Yeah.